Hello there, Miners fans, and welcome to another edition of This Day in Miners History, presented by Uncle Ray's. It's the second to last This Day in Miners History of the season as we continue with our four-part series on the 2012 Frontier League Championship Series. Tonight, we're going to talk about Game 3, and joining me is the manager of the Miners, Mike Pinto. Mike, once again, hi. Hey, glad to be back. Also joining us, the former voice of the Southern Illinois Miners from 2012 and 2013, Mike Ventola. Hello, everybody. Also joining us, two more special guests, the Miners' former trainer, Chris Stone. Chris, how are you? Wonderful. Thanks for having me. And our last special guest is former Miners' all-star second baseman and longtime Miners' hitting coach, Ralph Santana, joins us. Ralph, how are you? Good. How's everybody doing? Thanks, thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. Now, just to set the scene here, you're up 2-0 in the best of five championship series coming home for the first time, the, the Frontier League championship series being played at Rent One Park after three times making the division series, not being able to get to the championship series. You're greeted by a crowd of 3,312 fans. It is still the largest attendance for a playoff game in Miners history. So Mike Pinto, we'll start with you. What'd you think of the atmosphere that night? Well, first of all, credit to Tim Arsenault and all the staff who really, <clears throat> they really worked hard when, when we knew how the playoff schedule was going to, to lay out. They really got after it and, made sure everyone knew and we had people excited. Well, we had tailgates going on outside and we had players out there kind of, you know, hanging out with the fans. And it, it was, a, it was really a great atmosphere early that night. Well, broadcasts work best with an audience as Mike Ventola knows. What was it like for you to call that game with that, with a huge crowd in the house? It was a lot of fun. Mike brought up a good point how there were folks tailgating before the game. And, you know, it, I made it an effort to, try to get out into the parking lot and walk around, you know, ahead of time. I tried to make sure I got everything I needed to get done ahead of time um, and, you know, make sure then, you know, get lineups and stuff like that on my game prep. But I can even recall there were, there were fans that were tailgating, eating, drinking, having a good time. But then I remember this one fan, I forget who it was, but he was dressed up like a, like a minor to a T. Um, he had the garb. He looked perfect. And I remember getting my picture taken with him because it was just so – Awesome to see just how fans were all in and excited for their uh, Southern Illinois Miners up two games to none and a chance to potentially on this night to sweep and win it all. So, um, I mean, this was perfect. Um, I'll be honest with you. For me, it was – I was a little – I was a little – I'm feeling it a little bit just because it's like I'm thinking, man, if we're in a position to win this thing, I can't screw it up. You know, this is going to be history, you know, outside of the guys on the field. But even from what I do, I have a chance to, you know, have a teeny tiny – a uh, bit of part of history so it was a lot of fun listen Ralph the uh, confidence of the team must have been at an all-time high you hadn't lost yet in the postseason you were 5-0 and going in so what was that night like for you oh uh, it was crazy I'm, I'm glad you guys had a great experience but uh I was too busy prepping and had so much on the line writing that uh, fans weren't anything to me I was making sure our T's were crossed we had everything our game plan was held how Mike wanted it to be held. So I was I was in the coach's locker room prepping for the game the whole time. I don't think I slept at all. Uh, but the confidence of the players, let me tell you something, of uh, that team was, before that, it was unbelievable. Um, this team didn't believe in losing. Uh, they were even telling me, uh, me and Mike, we got this. I, I don't know what you guys are worried about. We, we got this. Um, and I'll, I'll rewind it even further, and Mike can, Mike can further uh, – talk out about us more of the series before when we played the Beach Bums. I mean, they were the best team in the league, and they were telling us that, you know, they can't hold us. And me and Mike are looking at them like, are, are you – Are you? they got three guys with 30 jacks on that team. Are, are we getting here? Like, we're in a dogfight this series. You know, we, we came out and they, they had no regards. They just played to win like they were going to win every game, and we swept them. And coming into that series, I mean, their confidence and the way they carried themselves and the character of guys that Mike brought in there – was far none the best I have seen in Miners history. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I'll completely echo that. Uh, we were, Ralph and I were definitely still having to put our work in, so we didn't get to walk around in the parking lot or anything like that. Um, <laughs> that, time of year, that time of year in the Frontier League, it's always a little bit different because you can have great crowds all throughout the season, but um, in September, you're competing with school, you're competing with football and everything else, and all we knew was that we still had work to do. Um, and the guys were very task-oriented. They didn't get distracted or anything like that. They, they were all business. 
The amazing part is normally when you have a big crowd in the ballpark, you normally have a lot of groups, groups that have come together to games. That game was different in that everybody came for one reason. They weren't part of a group. They were coming to watch Miners baseball that night, and they were there to watch us win. I remember Tim Arsenal talking about that the, on the business side, no one left their seats. Nobody was getting up, going to the concession stand. Everybody was – they were there to watch us win. And that's what made it, it really so special in both of those nights, really. Well, in game three, Mike, Cody Hall gets the start, and he's a bit of a, a funky right-hander. He won his first nine decisions, but up until 2015 was a minor's record. A 2.63 earned run average as a rookie in the regular season as a starting pitcher in the Frontier League. So outstanding year that he had for you. And you found him out of a small school in Alabama, which is where he last played in college. Uh, what was the process that got Cody Hall on the team in May? Well, fortunately, over the years, I've developed a network of people that – make recommend recommendations to me as players. And Cody was playing on a team out in California, um, kind of a collegiate summer wood bat league in a way. And it had a lot of dominant success. And, you know, it's funny as Cody kind of came in and he, he didn't realize the moment he was in, he was just pitching this, this was just fun for him and had no grasp of, what a big moment it was. And I say that with great compliment because when you know too much, you start putting more pressure on yourself. Well, there's no pressure on Cody. He didn't lose while he was here. All you, you just walked to the mound. You, you threw six innings or seven innings and your team scored a bunch of runs and you won again. That's what he did. So he didn't, he didn't know any better to go into that game. Well, you get off to a good start as well. Uh, RBI single by Ken Gregory in the first. He also doubled to set up the second run. We've talked about how he was clutch uh, in previous editions of this day in minors history earlier in this series. And then Ken and Lester comes up again, The uh, one of the heroes in Florence. Uh, RBI double in the bottom of the fourth after Florence had tied it up. It was his fourth RBI of the series, his fourth extra base hit of the series. Mike Ventola, speaking as broadcasters, when players are that hot, every single time that they come up with a chance to do something and they come through, it's an awful lot of fun for me personally. Did you feel like every single time Cannon Lester was up at the plate, he was going to do something good? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it was and it's easy to say from my vantage point, but I felt like at least he would hit everything hard. You know, everything looked – it wasn't just a baseball. I felt like everything looked like a beach ball to Cannon Lester. He was just – you could tell he was locked in. He was – and, and obviously we talked about it, um, you know, in earlier episodes, you know, and how he was in the Traverse City series and, and in the early goings here against Florence. But I could even tell, you know, that night and, and how the series was going that it was hard. Cannon was in an old, close to an impossible out. He was playing that well. And I really felt like, especially too, I think Mike had him batting ninth at that point in that game three. Um that, you know, for some time, guys, you know, pitchers, they think when you get to the eighth and ninth spots, uh, these may be a little easier outs, not for Cannon Lester. He was barreling up everything. And once he broke that 2-2 tie, made it 3-2, to two, I'm thinking, great answer, especially after Florence tying. I'm thinking, right, momentum back with the minors. Um, but then, obviously, things took a little bit of a different turn. But still, Cannon showing once again why he was, without question, one of the big heroes of this entire series. Ralph, what do you remember about Ken and Lester being his hitting coach in 2012 and 2013 and also 2011 as well? Yeah, Ken, Ken was always, always had the potential. Um, he was a spotty guy, so he was a role player uh, for us. I mean, we had all-stars there. I mean, we'll block it 18 or 17 home runs a year before, and he was our, you know, considered to be our second baseman at the time. Um, but you couldn't beat Cannon's heart. He had more heart, more passion, and more grit than half the people on the team. Um, everybody loved him great character guy I mean he just got it just played the game well soaked it in did everything and then you know he grew over the season and what Cannon became at the end of the year was amazing and reaching his potential and that's what Cannon was Cannon could have probably hit one or two in that lineup but we had him down there because our lineup was so stacked but Cannon just was seeing it and uh was doing very well let me give you a quick Cannon Lester character story and uh he won the award that year um, that uh, the Fran Reardon Award is given out for citizenship. We had 
uh, rented out Wiffley Field to play a wiffle ball game uh, during spring training. We had, um, you know, barbecue and divided up teams, and the guys were all playing fun and have a wiffle ball. And the gentleman from Wiffley Field asked if there, there was a special needs group of children that um, he wanted to know if they could come over and watch us play this game. And they came over and were cheering us on. And the next thing you know, I look over and Cannon Lester had divided them up into teams and he was pitching to them over, like over on the side so they could play their own game and they could be involved. And it was really a special moment. And it said uh, so much about his character and who he was. Absolutely. And if I'm not mistaken, too, real quickly, Jason, um, Kelly Burke was uh, doing a story on Whiffley Field at the time, too. Um, and she, if I'm not mistaken, too, Mike, correct me if I'm wrong, but she ended up doing a story on Cannon in that situation. Um, where at least, you know, there was conversation about it. But still, like, it was just really neat to see and adding to the characters, Mike said, of what Cannon Lester was all about. Yeah. Well, Florence's backs are against the wall. They have to win this game, and sure enough, they take a 4-3 lead. They score two runs off Cody Hall and turn the game over to the bullpens. And it's another Miners' turn to step up, another relatively late-season acquisition in Reese McGraw. And, Mike, yet another, again, another uh, acquisition to help the bullpen down the stretch of the season. He steps up big and keeps you in the game, uh, down by just one run, and gives you a chance to make a comeback there. Three and a third scoreless innings and three strikeouts out of the bullpen. Yeah, um, again, it's another one of those stories that he had been the closer at Creighton University, gone down and played uh, a couple games down in Amarillo um, in the American Association, or the United League, I think it was at that point. And the manager there was able to get an experienced guy to come in and called and asked if he would fit with us. And obviously he pitched really well, but again, one of the side stories, Reese had to go back to college. And so he, he left the team, went back to college, and then came back for the playoffs. And, uh, you know, with, with the way he pitched and, you know, he was one of those guys that threw from the side down under a little bit and um, was tough to pick up. And he was definitely a righty matchup um, that he was tough on him. I remember Reese McGraw pitching with Windy City my first year in 2014. He, he was every bit that tough uh, righty matchup guy that you mentioned. So you're in the game. You're still down only four to three. And then comes the bottom of the ninth inning, which is going to be the meat of this video. I can already sense it. You go into the bottom of the ninth, down by one. Carlos Mendez leads off with a single. And by the way, Carlos Mendez four for seven when leading off an inning in the championship series. Will Block sacrifices him to second base. The moment finds Cannon Lester again. He hits a ground ball to Junior Orojo at shortstop. We talked a little bit about Orojo in the last video and how good he was. He commits an error, the first error of the game, but the fourth of the series for Florence. And so Mike Ventola, in a, in a situation like this, the tying run is in scoring position here at third base. And Alvaro Ramirez coming up to the plate. Did you think you had him there? I mean, look, in that situation, I know when Alvaro was up at the plate, I'm thinking, we're going to win this game. Like, I'm thinking, at that point, the error had been committed, and I'm thinking, all right, you know, it's time to, you know, watch this team after this magical run, you know, what's been on a magical run, really just throw the cherry on top and win this game. Um, you know, and, and Alvaro, you know, getting the opportunity to put the ball in play, but – Obviously, the end result of that, Jason, wasn't what I was hoping for. You know, at that vantage point, things kind of then barreled, you know, dominoed into a certain other, you know, aspect of what ends up happening. And uh, it's great, too. We have an, an extra guest here because I'm sure he'll have a lot to say what happened next. <laughs> well, you uh, you kind of kind of pulled the curtain up there with, uh, with what happened next. So, Alvaro Ramirez, with the infield in, he hits another ground ball to Junior Orojo. And what happens is that Orojo throws home, Mendez breaking for home right away. And Ralph, you can, you were right there at third base. You can obviously shed some light on the, on the situation. But uh, Mendez is called out at home by Joe Harris, who's a veteran umpire, one of the better ones in the Frontier League for years. Uh, 
Ralph, I guess we're going to start with you because uh, you you were the first one in to argue the play. So, uh, so I was, I, what was the yeah, discussion? The ball, what did the, ball, you see? the ball was hit to a Royals right. So, I mean, he made one. I mean, like a Royal does, makes another play. I mean, takes four steps to his right, throws the ball to home plate. Um, it's a close play, and uh, for me, um, it was just. We've been so close for so long uh, to, to winning it. Uh, we've, we've been there, you know, sweat tears the last three years. And for me, it came down to that play and being so close. And, of course, you know, I'm going to see it safe. Mike has to tell me half the time, though, you know, what to be close. But uh, that's just who I was. So, yeah, I was almost down there. Bang, bang. He called him out. Me and Joe Harris, he still has his picture in his office to this day. So do I. <laughs> uh, it's it, it's a great photo of me just yelling at him and uh, Joe Harris being a professional that he is uh, had the call right. Great play on a Royal. No, Bowl. he did not have the call right. Did he not? No, he did not. Oh, no, he did not. He did not. <laughs> no, he did not. He and did. So he he sees um, I forget who was our catcher. Chris Anderson. No, their catcher. Oh, there. Oh, that was a Jim Jocko. Okay, so he's now Ralph is going crazy. We have to get him out of there before he gets run. And and Joe's not going to talk to Ralph much. You know, that's that's the thing. You talk to the manager, you don't talk to coaches. So I go and go, Joe. What do you have there? And he goes, Mike. I can't believe you're out here. That wasn't even a banger. And he said, he was like way up the line. He got him way up the line. And I said, Joe, this is going to be one of those moments. This is the biggest moment in Southern Illinois baseball sports history. Here's what's going to happen. We have three TV stations that are filming this game to air on the news tonight. And you're going to go home tonight, and you're going to turn on the news and see how badly you kicked it. I mean, look at the look. If you really look at it, look at the look on Mendez's face. It was like, absolutely not. So, no, Ralph, no. He was safe. Yeah. I mean, there, was no, there was no motion, just no, <laughs> out. No, he was not out. Right. So, all these years later, see, now you're getting me worked up again on it. <laughs> <laughs> just gotta throw the hook out there. That's all you exactly. got. <laughs> throw, throw it out there. Get him out. But yeah, I mean, it was just, especially on that, it was so close. You know, we, we've had three teams that we sh we should have won, and you know, the ball just didn't go our way. And you know how Mike, how hard he works in the off season, and how hard we work during the season, and and to be that close, and for you know, just the call to go not your way. You know, you never know. Now you have to play game four. And, you know, we've been there before. We've been up 2-0 before in the series and, and came back and got beaten River City. Wow. Um, so, for us, you know, you, you never took anything for granted. Everything was so close for us. And we were – we've been almost – we could taste it every year. And here we – I mean, we have it. It's there. It's ours. It's over. We don't have to worry about it. I mean, Mike Benfola, let me ask you. Um, so if Mendez is called safe, that's the tying run. Yes. If I'm not mistaken, we then would have had a man at third base would still one out. Second and third. Second yeah. and third. Second and third. So, yeah, because Lester would have been on third. And then I'm sure – well, because I'm looking at my scorebook here. Uh, yes, it would have been second and third. And then Kazi's up – you know, and Jake – Kazi's at the plate – and because and and you know and folks watching like Mike and Ralph are capturing this emotion well because it was that it was that close, but then Con the air was taken out of the stadium because I remember at that point you can just tell the Joe like you said Joe was good guy you know he didn't make the right call but the air was taken out of the stadium and Kazi pops out the first base and that ends the ball game and it just almost as if you know. The, the Grinch came right into Whoville and just took all the Christmas gifts away that in that moment, it was just like that. It was, 
It was yeah, uh, yeah it was because if we're tied at that point. They yes. walked. Cosby's, Cosby's walked intentionally. You got one out with with first base open. With no way coming up. Right. That's what I'm saying. But there's yeah. still no way they can't pitch to Cosby in that situation no, because you got close. you got to get you got to get you know the out at home plate. You got to get a force everywhere. You're not gonna you're not gonna let Cosby hit. Cosby, what did he hit last that year? 16 home runs, 15. Something like that. Yeah, yeah. Something like that. Yeah. You know, so you're not going to let Kazi put the ball in the air. He's gonna, he's a guy that puts the ball in the air all the time. Well, by yeah, the way, I, credit to uh, credit to Scott Taylor for uh, ensuring Ralph that you did not get ejected in that situation. <laughs> but uh, we'll, we'll close with you, Chris Stone. Uh, you were in the dugout, obviously, uh, for for that play, and you got to see the reaction of the of the team firsthand as they were batting. Uh, what was the mood like? Uh, Mike Ventola said the air was taken out of the stadium. Uh, what was it like in the dugout in that moment? You know, in retrospect, talking to David Harden after that game, and he was the most cool and comfortable person that I probably could have talked to in that situation. It's like, look, we're going into game four, and we're either going to win the championship tomorrow or I'm going to get the ball in game five and we'll win it then, which was great because we had a lot of young guys who hadn't been around with us that much who didn't know what Ralph and Mikey Ventola and Mike Pinto and I knew that we had been really close a lot of times before and we had had it snatched out of our hands before, but they didn't know that they didn't know any better. They thought, all right, got another game tomorrow. We'll just do it then. So what? But we were going for the Tums bottle. <laughs> they didn't know the history. You know, it yeah. reminded me a lot of, you know, and I'm not comparing the number of years, but what Cub fans went through with, you know, a hundred years of losing and, all the players in 2016 going, we, don't, we weren't here. Mm-hmm. I mean, we hear about it, but you know what? That was them. That, that's not us. And that was kind of our team that year. They, yeah, they probably heard stuff of things that had happened, but they didn't care. They, they knew they were good enough. Well, I do want to say, though, by the way, you know, we've talked about a couple of players here, and we haven't talked much about them. But Carlos Mendez was so good. Oh yeah, he was such a good player. He was the best third baseman in the league, and you know, it, every ball that was hit to third base was an out. You know, you kind of got used to that, and you saw this very level professional at bat every single time he came to the plate. And uh, you know, you say, well, how can you bat Cannon Lester ninth? Because we had so many great hitters and he was certainly among those and a lot of veteran hitters too and and if i may add too and a guy that was a first year guy for you mike and because it was funny because i remember when you had mendez you also had somebody else who had jason gannick who was also supposed to play some third base for you yes. but you you and ralph you guys asked him you know not so much asked him but you said we're gonna put a first baseman's mitt on you you're gonna go play across the way and he and he was he played a very respectable first base you know most of the season for you, you know, and, and obviously was playing every day in the playoffs. You know, a, a lot of credit to Ralphie there because Jason Gannick had the hands certainly to play the corner, but Ralphie had to spend a lot of time working on, and now you're getting a footwork. That, yeah. You know, how, you're going to pick balls. And again, it kind of just became this thing. Jason just moved right into that spot. And he's making all the plays over there. Yeah. So you don't think back and go, okay, we put a guy at first base who really never played there. But um, if you think back, why did we have to put Jason Gannick at first base? Do you remember? Uh, Ayala left, right? Matt oh, yeah. got signed earlier that year. Oh, yeah. Yep. Because Matt yep. Fields was our, our first baseman this year. Yeah. So, start the season. Royals well, came in and, and snatched them away. You know, they gave them, you know, a contract and that's right. And at that point you guys said, let's let's get let's give Gannick a look. Right. Yeah. And by the way, Jason, to go back on that play, uh Chris was not in the dugout. He was standing on the on deck circle while this was going down. <laughs> so I wasn't the only one about to get ejected. Chris was not <laughs> in the dugout. He was up and over the rail already and on on the batter circle saying, come on, Joe, come on, Joe. <laughs> so don't let him fool you one bit. 
he know, was just, he was every bit of intense. He might he was the most intense <laughs> trainer in the league, far none. Well, you know, I had to make sure Joe didn't have anything in his eyes because he. <laughs> <you know. laughs> Joe Harris, we love you, buddy. Oh man, <laughs> one of the best. Oh, that's great. Well, so concludes Game 3 of the 2012 Frontier League Championship Series. Come back tomorrow, Miners fans. You're not going to want to miss it. We dive, we dive right into Game 4 of the Frontier League Championship Series in 2012 with special guests and moments and players galore tomorrow on this day in Miners history.